to this is Valerie Bates I'm the marketing director for the city of Port Isabel and I'm here again on Throwback Thursday with Bobby Wells uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Port Isabel history and we're going to go back and kind of look at a couple of things um, that we talked about last week and that's why we put this first picture up here on the screen um, Bobby, you want to introduce yourself, and then we will we'll start swapping stories. Well, okay, okay. Well, I was with you last week, and I was not here because I wanted to be here, but I'm here because I want to be here now. When I came here when I was very young, I had no choice. I have a choice now, and I love Port Isabel. Um, well, Port Isabel loves you. How about Thank that? You. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so the first photo that we put up on the screen here is um, something we talked a little bit about last week, which was the home you lived in after the 33 hurricane. And um, so I've kind of forgotten to uh, share a couple of things that we talked about from this. And um, there's, a, there's a shot of the home as it looked about the time you moved into it. And the reason that I wanted to put this up there was to talk a little bit about after the 33 storm, the Red Cross came in. Yes, they did. They came in and we welcomed them with open arms. They furnished us with some cots that we could sleep on, army cots, well, they were hospital cots actually. And they brought in clothes and food and things that we really needed. And one of the things they did I thought was so interesting they brought some little pretty dresses for us little girls. And they had them in green, blue, and red check. And we all went to school after the hurricane dressed in those cute <laughs> little dresses with the puff sleeves and the little collars on them. We thought we had really gone uptown to have a brand new dress to start school. Oh, goodness, that can make a lot of difference. It does. And that cot stayed with you for some years. Yes, yes. That was those white metal cots with a nice cushion on them, and they were like a twin bed. And we, uh, yeah, we had those for several years before we acquired better furniture. So this is the house you moved into, and uh, one of the things that you pointed out a couple of times as we've talked is the fact that um, there's no insulation in these houses. No, single wood. So, so you would hear the wind whistling all oh, the time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots of dust coming in. No, they weren't. You couldn't see through them because you can see the little stripes in the house that they've had on the outside. But on the inside, they were just, you know, the framing. So uh, how about an air conditioner? <laughs> Never heard of it in those days. Uh, when was the first time you had an air conditioner here? Oh, my God, about? I was married before we ever had rare conditioning. And we, I mean, we didn't have it during World War II. I'm sure the businesses did, like the grocery stores and stuff, but I'm not too sure about that. It was, it had to have been in the 40s before we had air conditioning. It still is a treat, isn't it? Yes, yes. So we also uh, were kind of looking at this photo and talking about the, um, the electrical wires coming into it. And um, so you had electricity. We uh, had a wire hanging from the ceiling with a bulb at the end of it, like in the old days, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, we had, we had a light bulb. That house had one big room, but it was divided over there on the left hand of the door with a partial wall, which didn't go all the way to the ceiling. And of course, we didn't have a ceiling, it just had the gable roof. Oh, right. So, you know, it, it was, uh, and then the kitchen was petitioned off a little bit on the back side. You can see the window on the right hand side there in the back was a little bit of a kitchen. But And this might have been where the spigot was that you were talking about that you'd go out and get water. No, it was by the back, 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 back oh, okay. the fence. Okay. Back there by the fence was where the water spigot was. It was kind of one for the neighborhood. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah okay. it wasn't Community. one hours. It belonged to the neighborhood. But I don't think we even paid a water bill in those days. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah that was before they ran the pipeline from oh, yeah. Port Isabel to, oh, yeah. uh, to the river. Um, 
So I put this one in here because you were talking about your dad's barge and what happened to it during the 33 hurricane. My father had a fuel barge that I don't remember what particular brand it was, if it was Texaco or Exxon or Shell, but he, uh, he worked for some oil company and they brought in a barge with a little, kind of like a Connell building on the top of it with the big tanks and the boats would come to us to be serviced for fuel. And of course, we had a lot of our possessions there and uh, tools and whatnot for... Do what? Uh, tools, like mechanic tools. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Dad had all of his tools and everything there. He had big toolboxes that he brought from up north. But uh, Mother would man the, uh, the fuel barge and Dad was still taking parties to the island. When I say parties, he was taking people, passengers, back and forth. Right. And we would take them over and drop them off and then come back and wait and pick up another group and people would walk the beach and then they'd come back to the landing and we'd wait for us to pick them up to bring them back. And that's where we were doing what we were doing and what was going on when the hurricane was coming. So you, you were about 10 years old then? Oh, yeah. And the Coast Guards went to all the boats and told them to take their boats to the harbor and put them up that we had a hurricane coming. So your dad's barge was so badly damaged yeah. that it sunk yeah, right there? Yeah, it sunk. sunk right there and it was tied up by the railroad pier, you know, about halfway out. So yeah, in the corner of this uh, photo you can see the um, just a, a little hint of the railroad depot right here. And, and so that was the yeah, that was the railroad dock and where the train would back up so it didn't have to back up all the way to um, Brownsville. And, and that's, you know, it's another look at the housing um, okay. in that era too. Um, and the town of uh, Port Isabel was platted in 1872, but you'd never know it because there were no actual streets it was a series we of just had, We just cut across the field or walked in somebody's yard or cut behind their fence or wherever we wanted to go from one side of town to the other. You just took the shortest route. Just and cut across and we, we, had, no, we had dirt streets we, where cars could go, but uh, we didn't have very many cars, so we didn't do much traveling. Right. And we got... Uh, Fireplaces, of course. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. Laundry on the lines. Yes. And somebody tending a, looks like a horse and maybe a donkey here. We have free roaming animals, that's for sure. You mentioned one, uh, uh, one horse that you would uh, grab a ride with. We had a donkey that was loose that just combed the neighborhood and everybody fed it and everybody watered it and it just stayed around for us kids to get on the back and ride it for a while and jump off when we were ready. Never had a bridle or a saddle. We that just sat on its back and, and if it wanted to move, it would move, but if it didn't want to, it didn't. Right. Er early it. days of uh, public transportation. <laughs> you got it. There are a lot of horses too. There were a lot of horses that came to town. All the ranchers, the Barreras and the uh, different ones that had uh, ranches, they came on horseback to Champion Building and did oh, a lot yeah. of their shopping and stuff in those days. And they came to the bars on their horses because the horses always knew how to take them back home. <laughs> the bride, so the horse the is the designated yeah. driver. Yep. Yep. So, so this is another view that was taken um, uh, in the... 1915, 1916, by a soldier that was here, showing the uh, the bluff. It's kind of a different view, isn't it, Bobby? That shows. Yes, it up. is. Yes, it is. It was a bluff when I came here. It was very, very high. And, very high. And we were talking about water and um, and all these houses that had cisterns. Um, so you got this. You know, cisterns and rain barrels. Got a cistern here, and then one next to this house. Um, and this is the keeper's cottage. And if you've ever been there, uh, for those of you watching, 
out back is uh, there are replicas of the two cisterns that are connected to the house uh, with copper gutter so it can catch all that rainwater. So how, well, how do you feel about... We had a lot of rain in those days because we had a lot of greenery in Port Isabel. We were not a desert by any means. We had a lot of fruit trees, we had a lot of grapevines, and it, it, uh, we had a lot of water until we cut the intercoastal canal. And when we did that, bingo, we ended up with huh. storms. Yeah, we was very, everybody had a lovely garden in their yard later on. I'm not talking 33, but in, in the late 30s and early 40s, we all, the, people had beautiful vegetable gardens, but it was very plush with a lot of fruit vegetables, especially the um, grapevines. A lot of nice wow. grapevines. So the other thing we talked about too was that the keeper's cottage was um, for rent when in 1905, of course, the lighthouse was decommissioned and that lighthouse keeper's cottage became um, a source of rent for somebody. I think the Wootens lived there and they had a daughter that I went to visit a lot and we liked, to, I liked to, we, in those days us grown girls took turns staying at each other's house and that little window up on the top you could go out that window and sit on the roof and especially at night see the stars and stuff like that right yeah, yeah so I, you you have was, actually stayed the night in the keeper's cottage oh yeah definitely definitely there were a couple of houses out there that were very nice In those days, if it wasn't being used, it was up for grabs because there was no housing and everybody, there was no empty buildings. And right. Regardless of what they were built for, when the time came and it was empty, somebody rented it just like they did over at the radio deal. They had a lot oh, of right, deal. yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is another view of um, of Railroad Avenue and w once again you just if we kind of focus on what they were doing to capture whatever water fell out of the sky we have a rain barrel here and then um, over here and some utility lines running through town so there were um, a limited number of folks that had uh, electricity at the time? I would say mighty few, but probably more than I realized because a lot of people were using gas lanterns and uh, kerosene lanterns. Oh, right. You know, they didn't, uh, we didn't. Uh, May not have had an immediate need for electricity right. if you didn't have the appliances. Right, exactly. It was only for light. We never had any appliances. It was always just for light. And there were times I remember that we used a coal oil lantern because we hadn't paid the light bill and the light bill was probably all of five dollars. So we had to get it shut off till we could save up five dollars. Bobby, would you have called that the good old days? Well, I think I'm, I'm glad I was young and stupid and didn't know the difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We did, everybody was in the same boat. That's what made it so you know, it was a shared some, experience. Yeah, there were a few kids that came here with families that could build a house and have all those things, and we just shared them with the kids. The Burnells came here, the Schmitz came here, and they came and built nice homes, and they raised their families here, and they shared them with us. We grew up with them. So, so that's how you came to be able to borrow that bicycle. That yes. yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I never owned a bicycle. I enjoyed riding somebody else's, but no way. Uh -uh. So this is a, another look at Railroad Avenue, a little earlier than some of the other photos that we looked at. And um, going back to your comments of um, livestock in town yep and houses housing without insulation people would <clears throat> have those little fences like that to keep the livestock out of their yard 
so they could have their garden and their trees and their brush. And yeah, stuff. they've got some nice trees here. Yeah, but if you didn't have a fence around it, well, I was up for grabs with anything that walked by they wanted to feast on it. And over here to the left is the uh, Champion Building. Facing, this would be the south side. That's a pretty early view. I would say that was even before I got here because some of those houses are not familiar at all. Yeah, this was probably uh, 1905 or six yeah, or seven. Really? So we're thinking that the uh, Champion Building in this photo wasn't very old. It was built in 1899, so it was kind of a new building there. That's probably back in the days when it was Fontaine instead of Port Isabel or Point Oh, yeah, it was Point, yeah. Point, oh, El Fronton? Yeah. It was Point Isabel at that time. Yeah, I saw yeah. the, the writing there said that, but I wouldn't. Yeah. But, um, but as you notice, look at how many are shacks, just literally shacks that people lived in. Yeah, so you have uh, a variety. Definitely. And um, the other thing that we kind of noticed in this photo, here's, here's the keeper's cottage again, is how high up that is. We called it the hill. We called everything was the bluff or the hill because it was, it was you climbed up, you, you, you know, it was, we were, I, I understand at one time we were as high as the lighthouse lawn is. Didn't you tell me that? Uh, yes, Did yeah. You know they carved it down? Yeah. Yeah. Because that whole area back in those days was, was, was on a hill. We thought it was a hill anyway. And there's been some erosion because it also went, went quite a ways out into the water. About three quarters of a mile at one time, that point stuck out. Uh, but there's, there's your railroad tracks right here in the front. Right. And, um, and of course, your series of trails. Pretty good ones. Padded down pretty good, that's yeah. where the traffic was. So you can see they were starting to build some better houses in the area. And you thought this might be the Bobbitt's home uh, here? That uh, certainly is a replica, definitely. And of course, uh, this is pre-urban uh, renewal. Oh yeah, way bigger. We didn't have any of these shacks when urban renewal came in. Uh, yeah, this is the Bobbitt house. That looks like it is an uh, uh, air conditioner, water cooler up here on the top. And, and you got some, uh, some electrical service to some of those homes. See, even though shacks have fences around them, that's the only way we could keep anything from being on our front porch or coming on in our house because our doors were open, our windows were open. So, you know, look at those fences. It's just made out of anything that would stand upright and laddered together. So what kind of things are you trying to keep out of your house exactly? All the animals, dogs and cats and chickens and <laughs> ducks and horses and donkeys. And, you know, I mean, everything was, and I don't understand why I don't see more animals in these pictures than I do. They were scared of photographers. I uh, was thinking they probably ran everything off when they did that because we had always people complained to each other about keep your animals at your place i know my dad had chickens in one of the houses but i'm going back now to the 70s and 80s and the neighborhood said because my dad's chickens would leave our yard and go next door and get on their yard furniture and of course they couldn't go out and sit on their furniture after the chickens <laughs> had used it for a loft so yeah it, we didn't have any strict rules in those days about what you no code no about. code enforcement whenever they and it was a lot later that they came in and said you can't have any domestic animals in Port Isabel and that just was terrible because we were all used to having I had my boys had kittens and dogs and you know and somebody give them a guinea pig or whatever and it, it was normal to have the kids to have all their animals yeah but we don't, you never see a dog on the street in Port Isabel today. No. They, they, and that's sad. That's sad. We had dogs follow us to school. Different life. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I don't see any activity. I don't even see any people in these pictures. 
Well, that is an interesting point. I mean, you have no, to. No, you think it's deserted. You, you think you're you have to look at something the, that everybody has yeah. moved away from. Now we see um, there's somebody here on this porch right here, and somebody standing over here. Yeah. But nobody walking, nobody on the street. And it looks like the shadows are directly overhead. Maybe it was just too hot. Well, that could be. It could be. Siesta time. There you go. Yeah. Now, this is an old uh, postcard. Um, turn of the century or so. And somebody inscribed it at the bottom. Another happy home at the point. So this was also um, another type of housing that existed here and many, many places along the Rio Grande using uh, mesquite and clay or mud and palm fronds. It could have been some kind of a little business that somebody did. Could be. You know, um, we did have people, believe it or not, but we had people that repaired our shoes back in those days. You know, we had a... Sh uh, Cobbler. Cobbler, I guess that's what you'd call him. Yeah, yeah, he, he was here for a long time and he was right on Railroad Avenue too. I think his place is still there. But... Uh, oh, that's very handy. We probably had some uh, people that shoot horses or did, you know... Yeah, blacksmith. Yeah, so who knows what all those buildings were used for at that time. Well, everybody had to figure out how to make a living so they could stay in their homes. So. Sure, sure. I think anybody who lived in Port Isabel in the early 30s and 40s lived in one of those cottages. That's the Bayview Tourist Court and it filled a complete city block and it had cottages inside as well as all the way around. And the openings there are the garages. There was a garage between each cottage. So and it was like an efficiency. It had a bathroom. But it was all pretty much one room inside, but it was had different petitions that were not complete petitions, just partial. And you slept there, you ate there, and you, you know, they had a private bathroom, but that was kind of like a nice efficiency. Had an ice box, had a stove. Wow. You know, and uh, I know the Causeys lived there. The, a lot of people live there. I know it comes up in the newspaper all the time, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the announcements. Um, So-and-so moved into town and they are staying um, Bayview. Bayview Courts until their home is built or, built yeah. or until they yeah. could find a home. Yeah, yeah. But that, that looks like kind of an active place there um, in spite of the fact that there are no paved roads. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, activity housing and other buildings. They were there a long, long time too. They, they, they made it through World War II because uh, I lived in one of those when Doyle was born and Doyle was born in 46. And I know both of the Causey boys lived there when they were born. <clears throat> and the, um, the Myricks lived there. Oh, I can just name a lot of people that that, that was where they lived. Whenever Archie was a butcher, for uh, Floyd Bobbitt, he lived in one of the cottages and the uh, grocery store was in the apartments. Oh yeah, we'll see that I think in the next slide. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. so. And yeah. Here, here's a cow, Bobby. There you go, we got some livestock. Dr. Hockaday had a cow. He sold me milk after Doll was born. That's I mentioned that in the last time yeah. I said I think that uh, one of the boys probably had to milk the cow. This is a nice picture of the cottages. It, it's much nicer. But see all the little houses inside of the cottages? They were a lot nicer. They, they were probably had a bedroom. Oh, there you go. You know. And uh, this you mentioned was? That, that would be Floyd Bobbitt's grocery store called B&B &B Grocery. And Archie was and this, the butcher. Um, this is the post office, you're thinking, where you weathered the 33 storm. That's right. 
That's right. The people lived upstairs and the postmaster and his wife lived upstairs and the post office was downstairs. And we were downstairs in the hurricane. So um, just to talk about that for a second, you said as a um, 10 year old girl that that water was coming up to your waist or so. Oh yeah, I was. they had to put me up on one of the uh, the, uh, counters or? Yeah, where they did the the clearing of the mail, they put me up there. And my niece was only, she was born in February and she was born in 33, so she was only six months old when the hurricane hit. Um, So that'll give you an idea how much water came in to Port Isabel. That's pretty remarkable. Now we're getting uptown. So we I got some pavement. We got some right. sidewalks. Look at that. Um, awesome. Yeah, just about the time Port Isabel was really making some improvements, um, and this was taken about six months or so, five months before the '33 hurricane in True. April, and that's a pretty busy downtown. I bet you have a lot of photos by Garner. He was quite a photographer in those days, and he did a lot of postcards and stuff in those days. Um, Yeah, it's a real treasure to uh, find images like this. Otherwise, these stories would be lost. And and to have your narrative with it is just priceless. That that, uh, building, the two-story building there to to the left, um, I've read accounts, was a real source of pride for Port Isabel. It was a two-story office building. So um, it was really quite new in this photo, which is why it still has that four lease sign. And, you know, everybody looking forward to um, a better day, and then we're just at the mercy of a hurricane. Caught us off guard, big time, big time. That's a little later view. Of course, this is after the hurricane, but a little later view of downtown. Uh, Hawkins Cafe, Seabreeze Cafe, um, and there's a Gulf uh, station there to the right. Yeah. And uh, we, we couldn't help but notice, looking at this photo, um, the skyline of South Padre Island. Not much there, is there? Really uh, barren. No, I, I think that's probably the Brazos uh, Island lighthouse there. And you got the Coast Guard station and the hotel. Wow. And lots of piers. So some of these were... We did have a lot of piers back in those days. It was unreal. Of course, now it takes an act of Congress to get one built. But in those days, wow. And we had a lot of boats, a lot of rowboats. You know, we people rented rowboats and people came here and got in those and spent the day just rowing around out in the bay. It was awesome. Going crabbing, going fishing, just going swimming. We lived on this bayfront. I mean, everybody did that came here to have a good time. Yeah, it's a pretty nice. Um, water it water attracts people. Just love to be next to the water. Because everybody didn't go to the island in those days. People came to Port Isabel to have a good time. People did go to the island. There were some that did go over there, but it cost money to go across to over there, and there wasn't much over there when you got there, so. They, they spent a lot of time in Port Isabel, the visitors. They, they, they enjoyed our area and they, and this, I, don't, I don't see any beach umbrellas or anything like that, but at the same time, they could go out and they going out on the wharves. We had fishing all up and down those wharves, you know, and there were some places that rented fishing tackle, probably the college and the Sullivans did in those days would rent you cane pole and a little oh, bit of tackle, yeah. you know. And us kids, of course, we fished all the time. Well, we see in this little booth here, there's somebody uh, waiting for a customer. 
I don't know where everybody is. Seabreeze Cafe's probably yeah. got most of them in there eating, I guess. Got somebody right here. But you're right. Looks like a ghost town. It does. All of the pictures look like a ghost town. This is a bit of an older view, but it has a lot of new um, construction in it. Uh, you see some new uh, cedar roofs there in this photo. Yes, definitely. And uh, this this right here, I don't know if you know anything about this. Um, right here is a bit of a gazebo. And this would have been on railroad. So um, this is... This is when this railroad depot was newly constructed. So this is pre-hurricane. Uh, might have been uh, a bit before you got here. I was gonna say, I don't recall people using the railroad to transport people. I know we've talked about that before and... and um, I don't recall any, any station, like you said, that'd be the railroad station. Um, I would have known, God, I combed everything there was in town when I was young. We well, didn't have anything else to do but to snoop. And I don't recall ever seeing a railroad station. Well, they regularly posted um, in the Brownsville paper. They would change the schedule up during um, summer because more people wanted to travel to the coast. Okay. So they, they increased their um, uh, trips back and forth. And um, so you could come also, you could come on the first train and leave on the very last and make up, you know, spend as much time as you wanted here. But, you know, Bobby, you were already here. You didn't even need to think about the train. You were, you were already where everybody wanted to be. Well, I know that at one time they did have a car that was geared to ride on the tracks that brought the mail to Port Isabel. Yes. I'm aware of that, but some of this stuff that went on, you have to realize I was young and I was not aware of what was going on around me in that sense of the word, of what the buildings were for and all that, but, but, uh, So tell me about your, um, your first and only boyfriend. Well, I don't know if that was your only boyfriend, but tell me about Junior Wells. Junior Wells' mother had a restaurant right next to my father's garage, and we were both blonde Anglo kids that tangled together. We just had a good time. We played together. He played dolls with me. Of course, I always had the doll hanging on my arm. He had a cow. He had to milk a cow. I remember that, and he had staked the cow out. But then we, as we got older, we walked to school together. We didn't live close to each other. We only had the businesses close to each other. We didn't live close to each other. I lived quite a few blocks from where he lived. But everybody walked the same path to and from the post, to the post office to the, uh, to the school. And we went all through school together. We, we were good friends. We were good friends. We dated, but we dated other people too. We had other boyfriends and girlfriends and we just, uh, we were just together all, all my life. I've never had a day of my life that I didn't have Junior Wells in it, I don't believe. So when it came time to grow up and make a choice, I decided it was time to let him know I'm ready. So how old were you when you got married? 19. And uh, then you, you spent some time away from Port Isabel um, on, uh, well, he joined the Navy, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yes. So you he married in the Navy and he was gone in the service for two years and then when he came back, we uh, traveled some doing some construction work, building power plants and atomic plants and stuff like that. And then we came back and had our family and we traveled a little bit after we had the family too, but then we decided it was time to really settle down and we thought Port Isabel would be the greatest place in the world to raise our two boys. So your boys and were born here, you came back. So you were born at the Brownsville Mercy Hospital by Dr. J.A. Hockaday. Absolutely, we're very proud of that. And then the, almost 10 years later, 
I adopted a little girl, and I raised her in Port Isabel. But she was born in Louisiana. She was not from Port Isabel. And I had a pleasure of having three children, which was wonderful. I really wanted a girl. I had two boys, that's okay, but I wanted a girl. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we, we just decided that Port Isabel gave us everything we needed, so we never left. Wow. I lost him a long time ago and never found a replacement, because when you got the best, you just play with the rest. Oh my goodness, Bobby. Well, that says a lot. That really <laughs> says a lot. Right. Um, yeah. How many years were you married? I was married 34 years. Oh goodness. And I lived in knowing Junior for exactly 50 years when he died. Oh. I figured I had had 50 years with him. Yeah. Wow. And we had a lot of friends and a lot of people that were very supportive and still are. I'm, I've never been alone. I've always had a lot of people around me because I'm a people person. Yeah. I well, like you're people. such a big part of this community and you've made that happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's the only place to live and grow up and be happy. Or still growing up. Maybe too fast now. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess in some ways. Um, I think this view was taken from the uh, top of the lighthouse in uh, the 40s. And you've mentioned this building right here. And it was never completed. Never was. What was it going to be? Do you know? I have no idea. Mr. Steinmetz owned the building next door, and I guess he was going to expand, and then he got old. And oh, so this building, this building right yeah. here uh -huh. is, okay. Yeah. And the one that was two-story is where we had the theater when I was growing oh, up. Yeah. When, well, and even until after I had my children, there was a theater there. And we've got the Champion Building here. This is the Champion Brothers Grocery and Market. And this is the north side of it, which also had the um, galleys attached to it, like the side we're familiar with on Railroad Avenue. They had a view of downtown and a view of, of the railroad. Uh, Gulf Station here. I think at one time we may have had three or four service stations, but at one time we just had just one. And that looks like, if you look off in the background, that this is a, it's kind of filling in and growing there. And uh, those streets are um, paved and some of them concrete. You know, most of them, we didn't have asphalt back in those days. Even the highway coming into Port Isabel was concrete. Now, this goes back just a little bit. A little but, before my time. Um, and put this in there for that hilltop view again of the, uh, whoops. See, look how high that is. Yeah. It was very high. Look at the lighthouse. It's almost level there. Yeah, well, it, it would have been. Yeah. And then down uh, Garcia Street, in this direction of Garcia Street, is um, kind of has a, a ravine. See some people in the cars, but I'm wondering where the people are and what they're doing. Where are all somebody those cars here for? Right Unless they've gone to the island. Why, why are, yeah, somebody what? leaning against a car here. Yeah. There's a, uh, this is a garage, a repair garage. And this place sold hamburgers. You got everything you need there. That's right. Repair your car, buy a hamburger. Yep. This is a, a close up view of that same photo. Just, uh, there's no re rhyme or reason to the parking. They just all pulled no. in and just yeah. stopped and shut it off. But I, I'm... There's somebody there. That's and somebody a lot here. Of people. There's got to be at yeah. least two people and maybe four in each car. Now, this is during the time when they were trying to do some development. They were doing a lot of promoting, that's for sure. And that's why J.A. did the Texas International Fishing right. Tournament. He was trying to get people to come here and fish and have a good time. Uh, by the way, we're going to be talking about that in, a, in a, a week or so. 
we'll be able to do a little program on the fishing tournament. Tiffs around yes. the corner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's on its 81st yes. anniversary. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. There's that building that was never finished. So uh, I included this one because the other day we were talking about where did you go grocery shopping? So um, this is one of those. Uh, Lighthouse Grocery was right behind this drugstore down the street. And uh, this is going to be uh, Powers Avenue because we've got Collie's boat service there off in the distance. So you got cafes. That's the street that we eliminated when we did the new entrance that we have now. Then we right. get rid of Power Street. We did, yeah, yeah. In, in the early 70s. So you had businesses on both sides. You didn't have a boulevard. You had businesses on both sides of the main street. A uh, busy little downtown there. Yeah, we were. Everybody's in shopping. This is a little, uh, predates that a little bit, but that's improvements made to downtown during that time when uh, so many people were showing up because they were interested in the development in and around Port Isabel and Bayview. We were very connected with uh, Bayview and the development. He picked, he picked right down the main part of town to put that, those cottages in, and they were there forever. And that's the uh, yeah over to the in the in the middle of that photo on the right hand side those uh, buildings here, right here, trying to uh, to grow Port Isabel, get people yeah. interested. Yeah. What do you remember about Central Power and Light? Well, what made us excited about it as young people is that they made, that's where they made the ice for all the fish houses and all of the fishing industry. And I guess Floyd Bobbitt also delivered ice to your home, and that's probably where you went to get the block ice and cut it into squares to put it in your refrigerator for you. And uh, every once in a while they would have to defrost it and clean it out, clean it up. And they'd throw all that shaved ice and everything outside. Well, Lord, we thought it was snowing. We thought that was the most. So word world. would word would <laughs> spread like wildfire, oh, and all oh, your yeah. kids would be they down put there. Put the word out. It, it got around real quick that it was time to do that, which was pretty exciting. But uh, yeah, we had our own ice plant right here in Port Isabel. Ice is uh, important. Very, very important. And I was married and had two boys, and I still was having ice delivered to an ice box. I didn't have a refrigerator, you know. Dolbear was born in 49, and I had ice delivered to my house. The ice man just walked in the door, went to the kitchen, and put your ice in your ice box, because nothing's supposed to be in that section where you put the ice. Right, yeah. If it was, you heard about it, because you can't put a bottle of milk oh. or something there. But yes. But if that was every day. You had to oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Yeah, and it would probably be, you know, 25 pounds. Pretty good sized little chunk and you kept it closed. But the ice box didn't have a two door. When you opened it, the ice was exposed. Oh yes. Because you had the shelves below the yes. ice, which is interesting because, you know, but it, uh, so uh, there wasn't any standing in front of the refrigerator with the door open trying to decide what to get out of it? I don't think so. I don't think the kids were allowed to touch the refrigerator. You, you'd have to uh, go through mom or dad you got and have a plan. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, ice was precious. But they loved to follow the ice truck because the pieces fell off of the ice truck. Whenever he would chisel it to make your size piece, yes, there would be extra pieces. And, of course, the kids always followed. It, it, we didn't have an ice cream truck, but we had an ice truck. And the kids loved to follow it and pick up the pieces. Yeah, it's like treasure. Something to suck on. Yeah. yeah. Fun time, yeah. And sometimes the ice man would chisel some of them for them, too. Oh, of course. It was pretty nice, yeah. Um, another uh, little view of, of 
of downtown Port Isabel looking towards uh, Railroad Avenue and um, a kind of a different angle of some of the houses that we saw earlier like this one over here on the left which looks quite nice and you've got some businesses all yes, along yes yes Carlos Cafe very very popular confectionery very very popular and that's that's the closest thing to a street there right right So you want to tell us a little bit well, about this? Well, I spent right 11 here. years there. Yeah, that was fun. And that where she was just flashing is there's a little shelf there. And when we had breaks or recess right or whatever you want to call it, we girls like to sit up on the ledge and the boys would come over and talk to us. And that was colorful because it was out of a different color of the tile. It was very attractive school, very attractive school. We'd love to see and a color photo of that. this is the high school side here. And oh, the to the other right side is the elementary side. Yeah. Oh, which is and why when it you was... walk in the front door. There's a long hall that goes from one door to the other, and uh, the auditorium was on the back side, of course. But uh, we um, and the principal's office was the window on the left of the big door. Yeah. When you walked in, you had to pass his office to get strategic. strategic. But everything was. Uh, there was a big long hall and all those rooms were off of the hall. Um, so, yeah. This was a, a fairly new a photo when it was, actually this is a postcard when it was first constructed, but. I can tell that because, uh, it, yeah, we had some trees and stuff there later. Yeah, and that's, it looks like a new uh, sidewalk. So, yeah, it does. Put this in here because you have a little story about the... This is so interesting. There was a gentleman that lived upstairs. He had to rent it out downstairs to the campings, but upstairs was Lance Harris. And he was such a character. He was so much fun to be with. But he had a Shetland pony and a Great Dane dog on that roof. They would hang over that railing, which was <laughs> hilarious, which was hilarious. And of course, back in those days when you went in the Gulf Cafe, you could buy a beer. So the guys would come there after work and have their little session. But uh, he didn't keep them there all the time, but he'd, he'd bring them out every once in a while. And how he got them up there, I have no clue, because the steps are inside. But, huh. um, and he also was a realtor, and he's the one that was selling all the lots over on the fingers when they were doing what we called oh, yes. modern Venus in yes. those days. Now it's called the fingers or what else do they call Well, it? some people still call it modern Venice, but yeah, it's the fingers. Yeah, but he was, um, he, he loved to do that because it really got the attention when people drive by and see those two animals hanging over that railing. It's such a beautiful building. It is. Very distinctive. It was very and it nice. had that um, uh, looking glass there on the top. Very nice. Um, and this is just going to be to the left of that, and um, this is pre Purdy's Courts uh, before they built that um, travel motor court there. And see, they had to level that in order to bring in the tourist court. Isn't that sad? Well, and they further leveled it out when they built uh, yeah. the Pirates Landing parking lot. Oh, oh Lord, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they really came down. But I lived where I ran up and down those hills all the time. Yeah, yeah it seems so pretty, well, it seems a little flat right now, uh, unless you're out walking and you can kind of tell there's some inclines. And, and so yeah, that's later with the... Yeah. You can tell they were on a hill. You can see the cottage behind, you'd have to drive up to get there. And you said that uh, those little cottages were brought in from Laguna Vista? There was a place out there called Redbird Cottages, and that's what these were. And uh, I think they'd get the two-story when they moved in here, but the other ones were with the, what we call the, uh, the Redbird. And they were in Laguna Heights, just... Oh, Laguna not Heights, quite, okay. Not quite as far as, uh, as the high school in Laguna Heights. And it was on the right-hand side of the street, and it was really some nice cottages, but they were there very long before they were moved over here. Oh, location, location, location. There you go. Exactly. 
Doesn't that look big and busy? It does. Yes. And you got a mixture of things, uh, really, because you got uh, Queen Isabella Inn, or or which is known as Queen Isabella Inn now, but it was Jefferson Inn and Red Arrow Inn and a couple Coastal. of other names. Coastal. Coastal. That's right. I don't know why mm -hmm. I was for Coastal yeah. Hotel. Um, yeah, there's there's uh, quite a bit going uh, on in this little downtown uh, across from Railroad Avenue. And uh, sometimes all it takes is a sign that just says, eat. There you go. And look at those crisscrosses there with the paths. Nobody wanted to walk where they were supposed to walk. Everybody Whoops. wanted to cut across. If, yeah, if you don't, if you don't yeah. have to. Uh, yeah, you just find a straight line to where you're going. And until you know, somebody builds a building there, that's yeah. what's gonna happen. That's for sure. This was very attractive. This is where they started bringing the people to process them Whoops. to buy the properties and stuff. It was a very, very popular area. And that ended up being the Mexican Mart and it went down in Beulah. It was still there for Beulah, but it went down in Beulah. You see how that's so modern compared to the right. White House? Look at that building. So that that would have yeah. been 67 when Beulah hit. Yeah. And yeah, this was taken about the 1940s. Um, waiting for the bus on Tarnava Street. And uh, another shot of downtown Tarnava before it was paved. And I put a couple of slides in here, Bobby, because you talked about uh, animals. Um, this is a World War II photo of a crop of turkeys in Port Isabel. You can see the water and the pier in the background. So um, you don't remember a crop of turkeys, I do you? I can't imagine where they came from unless somebody lost a truckload of them or something. <laughs> Why would we have all those turkeys? <laughs> not, and even, a, not even Thanksgiving yet. A little bit of trivia, which I'm sure we're going to bring up again. Um, just because it's so interesting, is this lioness that was a uh, Texas International Fishing Tournament um, mascot. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, before my time. Although I was there when they started the rodeo, so. I, I think this one might have got past you because those cars, you were here uh, before these. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I was here and this, this is actually out in front of the yacht club oh. and they have it uh, chained off there on the oh. ground. Um, and uh, water polo. We've got the team posing in front of their boat motor. And, and of course we talked about basketball the other day. We had a heck of a good basketball team. They were, we were, they were champions in the valley and we were really, really hard against uh, Los Fresnos. We, we gave them a hard time. So and yeah, we were talking about that. And they had so many more people, they had a bigger team than we did, because we didn't have any boys that, you know, that many boys here at that time. But uh, they, uh, they, were, they were a remarkable team, and they were, they were a bunch of fun to be around boys when I was in high school, definitely. So this is uh, the I announcement. Know pretty well, yeah. This is the announcement that they won that uh, uh, conference, the final conference game against Los Fresnos. And uh, just another little look at the downtown. We've got uh, two of these that were kind of side by side on Max Ann and Powers Avenue. The Sullivans took passengers to the island, and so did Collie. They were passenger boats. The Sullivans came from Sullivan City. They had property over there, but there was a little town over there, now Sullivan yeah. City, but yeah. Ed and Ma Sullivan had that, that business there. She she was a character. They were both characters. You had to put on a little show to attract people to get on your boat and go to right. the island. And that's 1948. That was very popular and they had some beautiful seashells. Beautiful seashells. 
a lot of arts and crafts in there. Yeah, you can see some of them displayed in the front window yeah. there. And this is our last slide, and I threw this one up here um, trying to um, see if Bobby knew what in the world was going on here. Um, if anybody out there can give us a hand with identifying what this event would have been, uh, leave it in the comments. And, um, and that's our last slide, but I'm going to give Bobby here the last word. You have anything you want to add to well, today's? Well, that one blew me away. I said that 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 has to be research. There had to be a reason for that to happen. It looked like a lot of fun for whatever it was. Yeah, it doesn't look like somebody voluntarily <laughs> dressed like that and showed up. So there's got to be a reason. Is, this has been fun, Valerie. Thank you very much. And I love going back and seeing where we came from and what we did back in the old days. Uh, we love you taking us with you. So really appreciate your time and. Um, to be continued. This was episode two. Episode three is coming up next week. Thank you so much, Bobby. Thank you for letting me do this. I'm enjoying it very much. Bye, everybody. <laughs>